learnt and mastered. And so let us never despise the dealings of God. Let us never despise the trials and the tests. Let us never look at them as, a, as something that's, that's cramping my style or bothering me because God knows how to reveal to us the state of our hearts through the things that He allows us to endure and go through. Are we here this morning? Hmm? Sometimes we want to shun those hardships. We want, to, we, want, we want what God wants for us. And I'm reminded of those two boys, the sons of Zebedee, you know, who just, Jesus speaks to them and tells them how he's going to be crucified and how he's going to suffer and die and how God will raise him from the dead. And they're not even interested, they're not even remotely interested in what he's just said to them. Immediately they say to him, yes, okay, that's fine, Lord, but please, we need to know something from you. Can you reassure us that we will be seated, my brother and I, one at your right hand, one at your left hand? You all know the story, no? And how Jesus says, that's not for me to say who's going to be seated at my right hand and my left hand. But one thing I want to know is, are you ready to identify with me? Are you ready to be baptized with that same baptism? Are you ready to be to, to, to take that cup, that bitter cup that I will have to drink? And are you ready to drink it? Put it to your lips and to swallow. So often we want the easy way out. We want the shortcuts. We want those little cheat cards, you know, where we've written all our notes and tucked them under our shorts <laughs> so that we can get through the exam or the test. Hmm? That's not the way that we pass the test with God. Hmm? We, want, we want the A's and we want the excellent results, but there's a life that we have to live in order to get there. And I believe that the Lord is calling us to open our eyes and to understand the times that we're living in. That we, we cannot afford to live like this world lives. Hmm? This instantaneous, you know, clicking buttons and everything switches on and everything moves and the shutters come down and the lights come on and, and you dim and everything. It's all there at the tip of your fingers. Hmm? But the Lord is at work. And He's planting. And He wants us to be able to grow in that. And there's pruning that takes place. And there's testing that takes place. Amen? Amen. Sorry, we don't seem to be too happy about that news. <laughs> but it's true. It's true. Life with Christ is not just all froth and bubble. It's not all just promises. Some people live only for the promises of God. Hmm? Only for the promises of God. Cannot serve the Lord if I don't have my hamburger from, what is it, E21 or? Burger 21. Huh? Burger 21. Burger 21. <laughs> huh? If I don't have my Starbucks coffee, I cannot serve the Lord. There's nothing in us that can, that can take that place uh, where we are in the hands of God, serving Him with His Spirit, with His dealings, with His work in our lives. Amen? And these two guys, amazing how they just want to do they didn't want to go through all the suffering, all the tests, all the trials. They just wanted to be there at His side. And many times in our own Christian lives and in the church at large, this is the attitude that, Lord, I don't want the suffering. I don't want to have to pay the price. Just give me the promises. I want the promises. And people are naming them. They're claiming them. They're demanding them from God. 
I was sharing recently about somebody in, in Africa that I heard even, he even knew exactly how many promises there were in the Word of God. How many promises in the Word of God. And every morning he would recite a couple of them and remind God of what God had promised to him. You promised me this and you promised me that. that and now it's payback time. God doesn't need to pay us anything. God doesn't owe us anything. We owe him our lives. He's given us everything that he could possibly give us. Huh? And it's now for us to step up to the plate and to serve him in the manner that he has called us to serve him. Hmm? In Mark chapter 10 and verse 30, 42, this is where Jesus has just mentioned that he's going to, to be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes and that they're going to condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles and they will mock him and they will scourge him and spit on him and they will kill him. But on the third day he will rise again. Can you imagine that Every time the Lord spoke about his death, he always said, I will suffer, I will die, but I will rise again on the third day. He never ever mentions that he will suffer and die. He says, I will suffer, I will die, but I will, raise, uh, I will rise again. Hmm? It's amazing. And you would have thought that after his death, that perhaps his disciples would have been around that tomb on the third day waiting for him to come out, but they weren't. Huh? They were all drying their tears huh? together, commiserating. And yet the Lord told them that on the third day I will rise again. Several times he says that to them. And still... They want to just be in heavenly places. I'm seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. I'm seated on the right hand of God. And the Lord says to them, guys, there's a road to take. There's a challenge. There's tests and trials to face. And he says, are you ready to identify with me in my death? That's the baptism the sufferings and the death of Christ. Laying to, laying that life, that old life, down, having it buried, so that I can rise in newness of life with Christ. And these guys are just so, so charismatic in, in their ways. No, oh, of course, that's easy. You know, baptism, that's nothing for us. Drink a cup? We can drink that. But just make sure that we've got the promises. We're reminding you, Jesus, you promised us. We're telling you, this is what we want from you. Who are we, brothers and sisters, to tell the Lord what we want from Him? The Lord is asking of us our lives. And I believe that this year, there's going to be greater demand on our lives, a greater challenge for us a higher bar that the Lord is setting in the Spirit. And it's by His grace that we're going to overcome. It's by His grace that we're going to be able to, to, to go over that bar. But at the same time, the Lord needs our will. The Lord needs us to be willing to lay our lives there so that He can work in us. He says, the children of of Israel went through the desert and he and and the Lord says that he put them to the test he led them out of Egypt into the desert so that he could test them it wasn't a picnic it wasn't just a fun time together but the hand of God and the word of God was challenging their lives every single day and some of them became rebellious, hard-hearted, started reacting against God. 
Does that speak to anybody? When the Lord puts us to the test so often, there's a reaction. There's a reaction. I'm fed up. I don't want it this way. I don't agree with it. Hmm? And then Jesus says in verse 42, But Jesus called them to himself and said to them, You know that those who, considered, who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to, come, to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Isn't that the example that Christ has set for us, brothers and sisters? Isn't that the example that we have to follow? He says that the rulers... Those that rule over the Gentiles, they lord it over them. They have an authority, a carnal authority, that they exercise over the Gentiles. And their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. That we are called to serve one another with humility of heart. And as we see our brothers and sisters going through that fire, that we stand with them. Huh? in faith and we allow the work of God to take place in their lives sometimes we become so emotional with each other that we try to protect each other from from the work of the cross the work of the cross needs to take place in our lives I cannot prevent you from going to the cross like Peter tried to prevent Jesus from going to the cross hmm? and he said Lord not you I'll be there. I'll make sure that you don't die on that cross. I'll make sure that they don't take your life. I'll make sure that you don't go through the hardships and the trials and the tests. I'll be there to protect you. And Jesus said, hey, you are carnal, Peter. And he rebuked Satan for trying to tempt him not to take that road. Because it was a difficult road to take, a hard road to take, a tough cup to swallow. You understand that? Yes. Even sometimes between husbands and wives, we try to protect each other. You know what so-and-so said to me today? You know the way I was treated today at work? Hmm? And immediately, we're in the same pot together. We jump into the same hole together. And now we're commiserating. I know it's not fair. I also experienced the same thing, you know? My friends, we're not helping each other. We're trying to take away the cross. And we're trying to emotionally help each other. Whether it's with your children, your, your spouse, whatever it is. But there's one road that we need to be pointing each other to. There's a test in front of you. There's a challenge. Face that challenge, my friend. Because the ultimate result is the resurrection life at the end of it. The ultimate result is the resurrection life. And that's what Christ died for. He, as we said earlier on, he didn't just suffer and die. He suffered, he died, but he rose again. And that's exactly what, the, that's the, 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 the route that we are supposed to take. I was going to say the route. Okay. That is the road that the Lord has called us onto. Suffering. The death, but the resurrection life that comes from it. And when we die to things in us, when we suffer and we go through that death and we go through it properly, we go through the whole process of it, there's always life that comes at the end of it. Hmm? And that's why we must never despise the sufferings of Christ. Never despise the tests and the trials. Because they are there to make us stronger. They are there to form us, to shape us. Hmm? Jesus says, 
Whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. You see, it's completely the opposite in the kingdom of God, in the church of Jesus Christ. It's completely the opposite to the world. If you want to be great in the world, you need to walk on people. You need to crush them so that you can get to the top. But in God's kingdom, if you want to be at the top, you better start serving God's people with a humble heart, broken, directing them to the cross, challenging them, encouraging them, take that road, take that cup, drink it. Hmm? Go through the waters of baptism every day. Baptism is a daily thing. You know that? Baptism is an, a daily thing. It's an identification with the death, the sufferings and the death of Jesus Christ. Something bitter that goes down. Something bitter that goes down. I tell you, have you ever tried giving a child medicine? <laughs> huh? There was a song that we used to sing, just a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down. Huh? Hey, Barbara? Yeah? But I tell you, when they squirm and they fight and, and they're spitting it out, it's tough. Hmm? And that's what Jesus was asking those guys. Hey, guys, can you take that bitter medicine? Can you drink it? And they just so easily, yeah, Lord, that's, that's, that's secondary, you know. And the Lord says, guys, you don't know what you're talking about. I myself am in anguish about what I'm going to be facing. Yet I want God's will to be done. Hmm? Are we here this morning? Amazing, eh? And whoever of you desires to be first shall be a slave of all. Hmm? We're happy to serve ourselves. We're happy to serve our family. But are we a slave of each other here? Yeah. Are we servants of each other? Are we watching over our brothers and sisters? Desiring for them to come to maturity in Christ. If Jesus had just suffered and died and never been raised, what would be the point of our Christian life? There's no point. Hmm? There's no life. It's just a life of suffering and death. But there is resurrection life. And that's why my brother Clint, I know that in all the suffering and everything that you might be going through, let me tell you something, that that resurrection life is powerful to take us beyond huh? that heaviness of, of the suffering and the death. That's always hard. But when resurrection life comes, it sets us free. And we're able to go to that greater level and face the next trial on the other side. Huh? There will be trials and tests for us to have to go through until the very last day. But what do we want in all of that? What do we want in all of this? What are we looking for from God? What do we desire from the Lord? Do we just want the blessings? Or do we want to go through something and see the purpose for which God is taking us through that thing. Sometimes we don't understand why God wants to take us through this. And so we refuse. We put on the brakes. No, Lord, hang on. I don't want to face this. I'm not prepared to go through this again. You know, sometimes that, that old experience, that previous experience, leaves a bitter taste in your mouth. But when you go through that thing and you face the cross, and you face the work of God in your heart, I tell you, there's, there's never a bitter taste that remains in your mouth. There's only joy and freedom that comes. Hmm? That's why you, say pe you hear people say, if I had to do it again, if I had to go through this again, I would do it gladly. Why? Because they've learned something. They've learned something in that in that trial, in that test. Paul says, gladly, huh? 
I am spent. My life is spent for you, gladly. My life is poured out as a drink offering, gladly, voluntarily. There's no bitter taste in his mouth. There's no resentment. You understand what I'm saying? Sometimes we go through trials and tests and there's a resentment that, that remains in us. In other words, <laughs> we're still in that process and we haven't experienced the life, the resurrection life of Christ after the cross, after the death experience. Let us not be resentful, brothers and sisters, of any of the trials and tests because everything is designed for our maturity, our growth in Christ. Everything is designed for that. That's why I want to encourage you. There, there are many gospels out there that will promise you the world. But if we want maturity, if we want growth, <coughs> if we want stability, if we want the life of Christ, there's no other way. There's one road. Paul says that I want one thing. I want one thing. To identify with him in his sufferings. To be conformed to him in his death. So that somehow I may attain the resurrection life. He, he doesn't say, I, I want one thing. And that is the promises of God. I want one thing. I want God to promise me. I want Jesus to promise me. The promises of God are yes and amen. When God promises, it's yes and it's amen. But we're not running after the promises. The book of Hebrews says you have need of endurance so that after you have accomplished the will of God, you may receive the promise. After you have accomplished the will of God, you may receive the promise. We don't want to... So often when you look around and the gospel that is being preached today in the world, there's no after the will of God. It's a gospel of promises. You can receive the promise. You can be rich. You can be successful. God wants you to be on top. God wants you to be above. Here he says, if you want to be a ruler... You need to become the slave of everybody. And I, I want to encourage all of you here this morning. Huh? Speaking this, this morning, we're just saying how incredible it is to see so many young people in this church. This is not an attractive gospel for, for people in today's world. This is not an attractive gospel for anybody, especially young people. And I thank God that there are those, there's still that remnant that are willing to take hold of the truth and to follow the truth. Still willing to hold up the banner of righteousness. Still willing to stand in the truth and to seek God for the truth because it's the truth that sets us free and makes us more like Christ. <clears throat> Amen, brothers and sisters. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served. Jesus didn't come to be served. He didn't come for everybody to rally around him and to do everything that he wanted them to do. He came to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. To save us so that we in turn could also serve others and give our lives Lay down our lives. Be an example for others. Amen? And then look at the attitude of this guy. Straight after this, this, this portion of Scripture comes straight after James and, and John have done their little bit with Jesus. And then Jesus says, but this is what, this is what the gospel is. This is what serving is. This is how you're going to have to live. And he says in verse 46, Now they came to Jericho, and he sat, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples, and a great multitude 
Blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then many warned him to be quiet, and he cried out the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And so Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you. And throwing aside his garment, throwing aside his ambitions, throwing aside his security, throwing aside his finances, throwing aside his life, throwing aside his job, throwing aside everything that was of worth to him, that one little garment that he used to cover himself and keep himself warm, he threw it aside. And he rose and came to Jesus, blind as he was, blind. Jesus is calling you. Well, Jesus can come and fetch me here because I'm blind. Can you not see? Jesus should come out of his way and fetch me here. No. He rose. He threw away everything and he came to Jesus. Are we sitting in our little corner saying, Oh Lord, if you don't do it for me, I'm done. There's some, there's our will, there's our part to play in this. I need to rise up and respond to the call of God. Are we here this morning? Yes. Okay. Taking off that mantle. Getting up off that little comfortable rock that I've been sitting on all my life. Huh? I know rocks aren't that comfortable, but maybe he had already worn, you know, what do they call that um, padding in the bottom of your shoe when you put it in? Huh? Yeah, but, no, sorry, memory foam. That's the one I'm looking for. Maybe that rock had a bit of memory foam on it. Because huh? every day he sat there begging for arms. Every day he sat there, and then this day he hears Jesus is coming through. And they tell him, hey, old man, please stop bothering everybody. Jesus doesn't have time for you. But he continues to shout even louder because he knows there's one thing he needs. He needs the touch of Christ in his life. He needs to meet with Christ. And he's not waiting He's not sitting back expecting Jesus just to come by. Oh, Lord, huh? I'm in the doldrums. Oh, Lord, I'm here in my circumstances and situations. I don't know what you're doing with me, but if you don't deliver me from this, woe is me. Huh? When they said to him, and Jesus heard the cry of his heart and the faith in his heart, Jesus stopped and said, tell him to come. And they said, hey, be of good cheer. Suddenly, Jesus does want to see you. He knew that all along. And he gets up and he throws away everything that he's accustomed to, everything that is of value to him. He lets it go to be able to follow Christ. Hmm? What are we ready to let go of? Sometimes when we go through those tests and trials, it's amazing how we hold on to that mantle, that garment. Uh, we try to hold on to everything that brings us security. I, I, I need to talk to this one about what I'm going through. I need to share with that one. I, I need to have this in my life. I need to have the support of this one. Uh -huh. Jesus went out of the city alone, stood alone. He was on that, that hill Golgotha, in the middle of two thieves, high lifted up like the serpent in the desert on that cross. And he stood there. Yeah. He hung there. And sometimes we go through a little trial 
and it's like all my toys are out of the cot. Huh? We, we call that a cot here? Crib. Huh? We have that expression. The kid's thrown all the toys out of the, out of the crib because he's having a little, a little temper tantrum. Hmm? You know what I'm talking about? Does anybody identify with any of that? Huh? This guy doesn't throw his toys out of the cot. Old Bartimaeus, he just gets up and he knows that he needs to touch Jesus. He needs to meet with Christ. And he knows today is the day that the Lord's going to do something in his life. Hmm? I know not all your plans, but one thing I know, Lord, I'm in your hands. Hmm? You are in control. Hmm? And Jesus stood still, commanded him to come, and he came. Throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. So Jesus answered and said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And he said, oh, Lord, I just want you to get me out of this mess. I just want to be finished with this suffering and this dying stuff and all this. That wasn't his heart. He wanted one thing. And the blind man said to him, Rabbanai, that I may receive my sight. I want to see. Lord, I need to see. That's all I want. Then Jesus said to him, go your way, your faith has made you well. Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and went on his merry way. Being healed, he had received from God what he wanted to receive. He had received the promise. Is that what it says? Uh huh? He received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. You see, when we go through the trial and we go through the test the right way, and we see the resurrection life of Christ in us, it causes us to be more united with the Spirit of God. Amen. And we want to follow even more. Yeah. We want more. Amen. Not just promises, more promises. We want more of the life of Christ. Amen. This man could have asked Jesus for anything. Please bless me with a million U.S. dollars and I'll be fine. I'll make my way from there. Uh -uh. He knew he needed one thing. He needed God to intervene in his life. How many of us realize that we need to be able to see? We need the scales to fall from our eyes and we need to see the glorious light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The truth of God's word. The revelation of his word. I tell you, without revelation, you, 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 you don't understand what God is doing. You can read this book and can see it in a completely different light. Without light, you see it in another way. And it means something completely different. But when you see with revelation of the Word of God, it's completely different. And it causes you to follow the Lord. Not to go ahead of him, not to drag behind him, not to do your own thing, but to follow Jesus on the road. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing, folks? We have a wonderful gospel. I tell you, I cannot thank the Lord enough for the way that he has, he has come to us. I was speaking to Rod yesterday. Rod was just saying to me, Len, I, I, I don't understand. Why us? You know? We don't want to ask questions, but how privileged we are. And we need to acknowledge that we are a privileged people. We are a privileged people. To hear the truth that challenges us, that strips us at times, that puts us in the face of, of terrible hardships, 
and yet we still want to follow the Lord on the road. Hmm? Isn't that amazing? <laughs> if you don't have revelation, I'm telling you, you'll take that door and you'll never come back. But when the Lord starts to reveal to you what He's busy doing, and that, that, that test and that trial that you're busy going through is for your own good. It's there to, to mold you and to shape you and to form you into what Christ wants you to be and not what you think God wants you to be. His purpose, His plan for your life. Amen? Amen. Because I know not all His plans. I know not all His plans. But I don't want to be bold and full of self-assurance and commanding from God demanding from God, telling Him what He needs to do, reminding Him of His promises. Don't forget, Lord, You promised. So what? So what? God has made many promises in His Word. But one thing He needs from us is our obedience. One thing He needs from us is my obedience in following after Him. For me to get up from that place of comfort, to throw away everything and to come to Him. Can you imagine? Huh? My grandfather, my maternal grandfather, was, was blind. He had a tumor on, on the optic nerve and he went blind when my mother was, when, before my mother was born, in fact. And so all her life, she grew up with a blind father. And I remember my grandfather sitting in his chair. And he would listen to the radio and to all the children's stories in the morning. And then when we would come after lunch, he would tell us the stories that he had heard on the radio. But often my grandfather used to sit and, and weep because he knew what it was to see. He had lived a life of seeing colors and people and all the things around us. And then suddenly that was taken from him. And I remember my grandmother often saying to him, but why don't you get up? Why don't you try and play bowls? Why don't you try and go for a walk? Why don't you try and do this? And he... he he had lost that desire to live his life. It was gone. When you see this man, Bartimaeus, and you see the desire that he wants to see, and he didn't want to see for the pleasures of this world. He wanted to see the plan of God. He wanted to know God's will. I want to see your will. I want to see your word. I want to see the revelation of your word. So give me my sight for that purpose. And he could have gone off rejoicing. The Lord said to him, Go your way. Go your way. Your faith has made you well. But he didn't go his way. He stayed there. And he followed Jesus on the road. Hey, brothers and sisters. That's a challenge for us. When God gives us, so often the Lord, just, the Lord just blesses us. Do you know, you don't learn very much from just the blessing that lands in your lap. But when you've been on that road and God intervenes in your life and He does something in your life, it becomes so, so precious, so valuable. You understand what I'm saying? When you've been through it, when you've taken that cross and you've, you've, you've identified with it, and the Lord takes you through that, you come out the other side. So I'm reminded so much of what our brother Neil shared two weeks ago. I, I, I just felt his heart when he said, guys, I'm going through something here. 
but I've never felt closer to God than at this particular moment in time. Hmm? And when you're going through things, the presence of the Lord becomes everything to you. You simply want to see Him. You don't want to have your sight restored for anything else. You don't want to be running after anything else. You want your sight to be restored because you want to follow Christ. Amen? Amen. And that's the result of the gospel, this powerful gospel that works in us. Not just blessing us, not just giving us all the things that we want, but stripping us, putting us through those hardships. Hmm? Those moments where it's cold and, and you're hanging on to your, to your garment to keep you warm. But when Christ appears and he's there and that work is finished, Jesus said, it is finished. Hmm? And he breathed his last breath. But three days later, huh, God raised him from the dead. Hmm? It's not finished, brothers and sisters. It's not finished for us. We need to come to that place where we say, it is finished. It's dead. It's gone. It's been removed from me. I've been through the trial and God has accomplished his purpose in my life. Amen? Isn't Jesus amazing? Huh? Oh, I thank him for the power of the gospel because... The revelation of his word, the light that comes from his word is amazing. It sets us free, challenges us. That's why I said in the beginning, his word isn't there just to tickle our ears, make us comfortable Christians. There is this challenge every single day in our lives. The challenge of the word of God working in us, bringing about death in us so that life may come to his people. If I'm not prepared to pay the price, I'm not prepared to take that road, how much life can my wife or my children or the people of God receive from me? I'm just a pillar of salt, good for not very much. Probably getting in the way of everybody. That's why, brothers and sisters, let us not despise the dealings of God. Let us not despise the challenges, the trials, and the tests that he puts before us. Let us not look at that and say, Lord, no. I just want to be seated at your right hand. Give me a place next to you. That people might see, you know, I'm an elder. I'm a deacon. I'm, I'm a leader, part of the leadership in the church. Jesus says, if you want to be great, become a servant of all. Even Jesus didn't come to be served. He came to serve and to lay down his life, a ransom for us all here this morning. Hmm? Life cannot emanate from you if you're not prepared to lay your life down. Life cannot come from you. Let us not be emotional with one another. Let's not try and prevent our brothers and sisters from going to the cross. Each one of us, as Brother Mickey often says, we have our own box. And what's in your box is not necessarily in my box. But what's in your box you have to face. And what's in my box I have to face. But God's grace is the same for all of us. And God's grace will be there for your circumstance, and God's grace will be there for my circumstance. But what's in my box, I have to face it. I have to take that cup. I have a cup. Maybe my cup's this size. Maybe your cup's this size. But God's grace will be there for you to drink it and to swallow it and to go through with it. Hmm? Maybe my baptism is only this deep. Maybe your baptism is a lot deeper. But it's all part of the process. Amen, brothers and sisters? 
Are we encouraged or discouraged? Hmm? That's the amazing thing about the gospel. <laughs> uh, it just points us to the cross, and yet we come back for more. Uh, but it's wonderful. When you experience that life, there's nothing that can be, can be compared to that. Hmm? Amen? Let us stand this morning. We're going to worship the Lord.